All right. Hi, second grader. So let's get back to Little House in the Big Woods. So I made it to chapter seven called Sugar Smell. So we're kind of whipping right through the different seasons. I like how she tells the story in order or in sequence of the events. So with, you know, it started in the fall time. There was butchering. Um, then we made it into the winter time and Christmas. And now we've made it into spring. And we just had the chapter about the two big bears. And now it's chapter seven. So even though it's called sugar snow, we are getting into the spring season. So let's find out what happens, okay? All right, chapter seven, the sugar snow. For days the sun shone and the weather was warm. There was no frost on the windows in the mornings. And all day the icicles fell one by one from the eave with a soft smashing and crackling sounds in the snow banks beneath. The trees shook their wet black branches and chunks of snow fell down. When Mary and Laura pressed their noses against the cold window pane, they could see the drip of water from the eaves and the bare branches of the trees. The snow did not glitter anymore. It looked soft and tired. I like that visual. The snow wasn't glittery. You know when you have nice, fresh, new snow and it's cold? It almost looks like it's shiny and glittery, almost like my nails. But now the snow is melting and refreezing and melting, and it looks soft and tired. <laughs> Under the trees, it was pitted where... The chunks of snow had fallen, and the banks beside the path were shrinking and settling. Then one day, Laura saw a patch of bare ground in the yard. All day, that patch just grew bigger and bigger and bigger. And before the whole night, before the night, the whole yard was just bare mud. Only the icy path was left, and the snow banks along the path and the fence beside the wood pile were left. Can I go out and play, Ma? Laura asked, and Ma said, May you go out and play, Laura? Oh, may I go out and play, Ma, she asked. You may go out tomorrow, Ma replied. That night, Laura woke up, shivering. The bed covers felt thin. Her nose was icy cold. Ma was tucking another quilt over her. Snuggle closer to Mary, Ma said, and you'll stay warm. In the morning, the house was warm from the stove, but when Laura looked out the window, she saw the ground was covered with soft, thick snow. So that happens sometimes, doesn't it, in Minnesota, where just when we think that springtime is here and the snow is going to be over with and we're going to start to see grass, boom, we end up with like a snowstorm and you feel like you're all the way back to winter again. So she looked outside and all along the branches of the tree, the snow was piled like feathers and it laid in mounds along the top of the rail fence and it stood up in great white balls on top of the gate posts. Pa came in shaking the snow from his shoulders and stamping his boots. Oh, this is some good sugar snow, he said. Laura put her long tongue quickly to a little bit of the white snow that was on her dad's sleeve. And it was nothing but wet on her tongue. Not like sugar. She was glad that nobody had seen her actually try to taste the snow. So she heard her dad say sugar snow, so she thought it was going to taste like sugar. But it didn't. Why is it sugar snow, Pa? She asked him. But he didn't have time to explain now. He must hurry away. He was going to Grandpa's. Grandpa lived far away in the big woods. You know, the Grandpa that rode on the sled down and the pig fell on his lap? Same Grandpa. He doesn't live too far away. He lives in the big woods where the trees get a little bit closer together and much larger. Laura stood at the window and watched Pa, big and swift and strong, walking away over the snow. His gun was on his shoulder. His hatchet and his powder horn hung at his side. And his tall boots made great big tracks in the soft snow. Laura watched him until he was out of sight in the woods. It was late before he came home that night, and Ma had already lighted the lamp when he came in. Under one arm, he carried a large package, and in the other was a big covered wooden bucket. So he comes walking in. He was gone all day long. And here comes Pa, back from a long day. I don't know really where he went other than just to Grandpa's. And he comes back with a big package in one hand and a big bucket in another. Or a pail. I wonder what's in there. Hey, Caroline, he said, handing the package and bucket to Ma. And then he put the gun over the hook above the door. If I'd met a bear, he said, I could have shot him without dropping my load. And then he laughed. And if I'd have dropped that bucket and the bundle, I wouldn't have had to shoot him. I could have stood and watched him eat what's in them bucket and package, and he'd lick his chops. So something good is in that bucket, and something really good is in that package, because the bear would have liked to have eaten it. 
Ma unwrapped the package, and there were two hard brown cakes, each as large as a milk pan. She uncovered the bucket, and it was full of dark brown syrup. Hey, Laura and Mary, Pa said. He gave them each a little round package out of his pocket, and they took off the paper wrappings, and each had a little hard brown cake with beautiful crinkled edges. So, almost maybe like a piece of candy? Bite it, said Pa, and his eyes got blue and twinkly. Each bit off one little crinkle, and it was sweet. It crumbled in their mouths, and it was even better than their Christmas candy. Maple sugar, said Pa. Supper was ready, and Laura and Mary laid the little maple sugar cakes beside their plates, and while they ate the maple syrup on their bread as well. So there was the syrup in the bread, or in the bucket, and they're putting it on their bread. Interesting. After supper, Pa took them on his knees as he sat before the fire and he told them about his day at grandpa's house and the sugar snow all winter pa said grandpa has been making wooden buckets and little troughs he made them out of cedar and white ash for those woods won't give a bad taste to the maple syrup to make the troughs he split out of little sticks as long as my hand and as big as my two fingers and near one end grandpa cut the stick half through and split one half this left him a flat stick with a square piece at one end. It's hard for me to imagine, but I do have a little visual that I'll show you, so let me finish this page. Then, with a bit, he bored a hole lengthwise through the square part, and with his knife, he whittled through the wood till it was only a thin shell around the hole. The flat part of the stick he hollowed out with his knife till it was a little trough. He made dozens of them, and he made ten new wooden buckets. He had them ready when we first, or when the first warm weather came and the sap began to move in the trees. Can any of you make some connections here? Do you know what kind of trees that they're going to? I won't say yet. I'll let you just think about that. It is common around here. A lot of times you hear people refer to it as like the sugar bush. Maple syruping. Um, There's a really good episode actually on Curious George where he is, on the farm, because, you know, he lives in the city and he goes out to the country. And when he's in the country, he goes to the farmer Rankins. And I know a lot about George. My kids watch George. And they teach him how to do some maple syruping. If I can find that episode, I will share it with you on Seesaw. So I'll see if I can find it. If not, I can always find maybe a really cool episode on YouTube and I can share it out to you guys as well. But it's definitely something that goes on up here in Minnesota. But remember... They live in Wisconsin, and Wisconsin is a neighbor state to Minnesota, isn't it? It's right next to us. When you go to Duluth, you're actually very close to Wisconsin. All right, so let me go back to reading. So remember, he made new buckets, and he made dozens of these little troughs. Then he went into the maple woods, maple, maple syrup, maple trees, and with a little bit, he bored a hole in each maple tree, and he hammered the round end of the little trough into the hole and he set the cedar bucket on the ground under the flat end. The sap, you know, is the blood of a tree. It comes from the roots, and when the warm weather begins in the spring, it goes up to the very tip of each branch and twig to make the green leaves grow. So the sap, when it gets really cold, kind of hunkers down into those roots and stays there. But as the tree warms, as the temperature warms and it warms the tree, the sap begins to run, they say. The sap is running. And so what it means is it starts going up into the trunk of the tree and then out into the branches, which helps the leaves begin to sprout and turn green. So I'm going to show you a picture. Actually, I think I'll read the rest of this page because it's just a little bit left. And then I'll show you both pictures. Like There's a couple pictures. Well, when the maple sap came through the hole in the tree, it ran out the tree and down the trough into the bucket. But didn't it hurt that poor tree? Laura asked. No more than it hurts you when you prick your finger and it bleeds just a little bit. So they're not taking all the sap. Just like if you get a prick on your finger and you get like a few drops of blood out of your finger, you didn't lose all your blood, just a few drops. So they're taking a few, just a little bit of sap from the tree, but not all of it. So the first picture over here, I guess, be this one. This picture here is the cedar buckets that he's making and the ash buckets. And then these are the little troughs I was telling you about that he pounds into the tree. And then you can see it better in this picture. So he bores them or pounds them into the tree. You can see Grandpa over there. See how he's drilling a hole in that tree? Then he's going to pound 
that trough into the tree, and then the trough, they have to set the buckets underneath because they collect the sap. Now, sap is not syrup because they need to do something to the sap. Some of you maybe already know this and the steps that it takes. So every day, Grandpa puts on his boots and his warm coat and his fur cap, and he goes out into the snowy woods and he gathers the sap. So you got to do this. It's a chore. Once you do this, sometimes the buckets fill. you got to empty them out. With a barrel on a sled, he drives from tree to tree, and he empties the sap from the buckets into the barrel. Now, when he says he drives them, he's not driving a four-wheeler or a truck out into the woods, right? Look what he's using. A couple of oxen and a sled and a big barrel on the sled. And then look where he's dumping the sap. He's dumping the sap into the big barrel. Then eventually he's got to take the barrel somewhere, right? All right, so he empties the sap into an iron kettle, and there is a big bonfire under the kettle, and the sap boils, boils, gets really hot and bubbly, and Grandpa watches it carefully. There must be a fire hot enough to keep the sap boiling, but not hot enough to make it boil over, so it's got to stay right in that pot and bubble, and that's all it's got to do. Every few minutes, the sap must be skimmed. Skimming means taking off the layer of foam and throwing it to the side. Grandpa skims it with a big, long-handled wooden ladle that is made from basswood. So I'm going to show you a picture of Grandpa here. And look at that big iron kettle. And look how they have it set up over the fire. A big log between two trees. A chain holding up that kettle. That would not be easy to get up there, would it? Then they fill it full of the sap. There's the fire underneath, and there's Grandpa, and he's skimming. When it's boiling like that, it's getting like this crusty... Um, like foamy stuff on the top, and they don't want that on there. They just want the nice sap, so they they skim it off. They scoop it out, kind of like when you have to clean your pool and get the leaves and junk out. That's what they're doing with the sap. So when the sap gets too hot, Grandpa lifts ladlefuls of it high in the air, and he pours it back slowly to help cool it down and from boiling over. When the sap has boiled down just enough, he fills the buckets with syrup, and after that, he boils the sap until the grains, until it grains when he cools it in a saucer. The instant the sap is graining, Grandpa jumps to the fire and he rakes it out from underneath to put the fire out. Then, as fast as he can, he ladles the thick syrup into milk pans that are standing ready to go. In the pans, the syrup takes, the syrup turns to cakes of hard brown maple sugar. So that's why it's called sugar snow, because Grandpa is making sugar, Laura asked. No, said Pa. It's called sugar snow because the snow this time of year means that men can make more sugar. You see, this little cold spell we're having right now, and the snow will hold back the leafing of the trees, and that makes the sap run for a longer amount of time. So it's kind of a good thing when we get a little bit of that snow in the spring, even though we're kind of like, oh man, we got some snow, we wanted it to turn warm, it's good for maple syrup. So if we want to have a good maple syrup harvest, it's good to have the sugar snow, snow showing up in the spring. When there's a long run of sap, it means that Grandpa can make enough maple sugar to last all year, almost for every day. When he takes his furs to town, he will not need to trade for so much store sugar. They can use maple sugar or their syrup. He will only get a little store sugar to have on the table when company comes. Grandpa must be glad there's sugar snow, Laura said. Yes, Pa said. He's very glad. He's going to sugar off again next Monday, and he says we're all going to come. I think I'm going to stop there because I'm getting to, well, I'm really close, but I think I'm going to stop there. So, what we've read so far is that um, they got the snow in the spring, and we found out that it's called sugar snow, not because it tastes like sugar, but because that when you get snow in the spring, it helps the sap to run longer so you can make more syrup. And syrup, um, when you're boiling sap, it breaks it down and turns it into sugars. So that's why it's called sugar snow. And we're actually in the springtime. So I'll stop there and I'll finish that chapter and begin the next chapter on a different day. So I hope you enjoyed Sugar Snow, the first part of the chapter. All right.